Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us to an exciting webinar discussing modern technologies to treat complex foot and ankle pathologies, 3D printed implants, and sustained compression devices. I'd like to thank our sponsors, MAPE and Restore 3D. Let me see if my slide will advance here. Um, tonight, I'll be presenting. Um, I'm Samuel Adams uh, from Duke, and my co presenter will be Kush from Geisinger Health up in Danville, PA. And so, we thought we'd talk about combining these two technologies and teaching you that, and lessons that we've learned about how to use these technologies for complex foot and ankle reconstruction. So, in my mind, the problem is that in further cases, there's an unmet need to fill and stabilize large bony defects. And you can see quite a few examples here. Uh, first being traumatic loss. Um, certainly for acute deformity correction, there could be a space that needs to be filled. Obviously something we all face, non-union and sharp laps, as well as uh, uh, implant failure. Sorry, those are backwards there. Um, these are several um, uh, indicate both uh, the use of 3D printed cages and sustained compression nailing. So when we talk about Charcot um, and bone disease, I think it's important to kind of realize, obviously uh, the process we're dealing with is, about, is all about bad bone. Uh, there's firm evidence that was set forth uh, with the uh, ideas of the uh, rank L ligand and then also the nuclear factor. Uh, be uh, responsible for the abnormal intense osteoclastic uh, activity. With this uh, increased osteoclastic activity, there's that in increase in uh, excessive and unsupported bone, bone turnover. That leads to these micro fractures that would then escalate into micro, uh, macro fractures and end up uh, with joint destruction. When we talk about Charcot theory, uh, the other as the autonomic uh, neuropathy that deregulates the smooth muscle tonus of the arterial wall. When this occurs, there's a failure of that vasoregulation uh, and increase in blood flow to the bone, the monocytes, and then the osteoclast storm the affected site and accelerate that bone resorption we just talked about, resulting in osteopenia, which then increases the chances of fracture, distance, and joint laps with just minor trauma. So in all the contributors of Charcot, you have osteoclast, uh, you have the rank L and osteoprogenterin, uh, calcitonin, nitric oxide, and vitamin D. And you throw that into that cycle of pathophysiology, Charcot osteoarthritis, and uh, what you end up with at bone. So in bad bone, we have some limitations of this current technology. Um, we use allograft often. Uh, we have higher non-union rates and you know, basically using dead bone to take up large areas. We have graft collapse. Um, we can also talk about using vascularized bone graft, which is limited in size and certainly uh, doesn't always match our patient's suitability. There's metal augments that are off, uh, which are often limited uh, by not only size, but also shape. And then so it can do bone transport to make up for these defects caused by Charcot and implant failure, et cetera. Uh, but in some patient situations, uh, patient tolerance is an issue. And then we have to t discuss about uh, pin site infections also. When we think about other limitations of current technology on the uh, in fixation side, uh, we know that there are static fixation devices that are available uh, that have been shown in multiple studies, as you can see here below, to have lower fusion rates, especially in this patient population that we're most concerned about. So in tobacco users, diabetics, patients with neuropathy, bulk defects, and revisions, it's a high, excuse me, there's a higher non-union rate. We also know there's issues with static uh, nails uh, in regards to shielding of the bone and intraoperative compression that occurs and be lost as you get absorption on either 
other side of the joint when you're looking for fusion. These bone gaps then lead to non-union, and then unfortunately in certain some, uh, circumstances, uh, perhaps amputation. So what is a possible answer? I think this certainly fits uh, that uh, role. There's patient-specific uh, 3D implants that can be utilized uh, in a variety of shapes and sizes. And then you add that with uh, sustained uh, compression. Um, this certainly is a good option for these difficult pay population. So Dyna Nail, uh, it's indicated for use for tibio-tailor calcusion. Um, it takes the ideas of uh, compression performance of an external fixator and adds that uh, to the inside of a intramedullary nail. Night and all compressive element inside add to that compression and load the bone. The super elastic recovery properties of the night and all uh, elements allow the dynamic to automatically adapt to changes and load across the TTC joint. So in this uh, stress strain uh, curve here, you can see under stress, it uh, uh, gets to a maximum load. And then when you have the pseudo-elastic recovery, that compressive force is then added to the bone and across the joint. There's a few specific key performance benefits. Um, certainly the maintenance of up to six millimeters of compression across active joints. Uh, we also talk about uh, the stiffness and torsion, but the actively compliant aspect of the night and all, which that allows almost immediate dilation across uh, the uh, joint in order to add to the compressive forces. The stress distributed through the bone with the dyna nail is approximately 70% as compared to those other statically knocked, locked nails that to transfer only about 20% of those forces. Advantages of 3D printing, I'll let them talk about this. Thanks, Jerry. It was a great overview. So I'll talk about uh, 3D printing and, and 3D printing has many ages um, and is being used in in, in many, many industries throughout the world. Uh, but to focus on where we can use it uh, in foot, and we've all been faced with those, those complex cases like we showed earlier, is specific to, to us, shapes, sizes, the, the surface coatings, the, 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 any, any, almost anything about these events. And the 3D printing process can really get us increased in intricacy and complexity of, of our implants. And I'll, we'll show some cases here tonight. And here's just an example of multiple different cases being used throughout uh, the human body uh, in spine, orthopedic oncology, and trauma settings. And now we'll kind of focus on, on what can be done in the foot. And this was, this was my first ever 3D printed case. And it's kind of, um, it, it shows me that 3D implants can work and it shows, it shows the power of them. So this was a 46 year old female who was involved in a motor vehicle collision. Uh, she had multiple fractures uh, with bone loss. Here you can see on this x-ray, there's, there's an open fracture of the distal tibia and fibula with, with uh, loss of the metaphysis there. She had multiple associated fractures. But I think the, the, what, what really helped me with dealing with her is that she had a sensate and perfused foot and she's seen by the trauma service initially uh, who did recommend an amputation. They, they put on this external fixator and luckily um, added a cement spacer in there, but uh, they recommended the amputation. She came to see me. And so I had a long discussion about what to do next. I mean, could we find an allograft that, that could fit in this defect? Or I talked about the lymph allograft. Um, I could acutely shorten her and do, or do a bone transport, um, but that would be, you know, probably uh, seven being an external fixator, fixator, which she wasn't happy about, or I could have uh, performed an amputation like the trauma service initially recommended. But that was difficult for me because she did have, she was young, she had a sensate and perfused foot. And so what we, I ended up doing after a long discussion with her is I used a 3D printed implant. And here you can see that implant packed with bone and being placed, placed in her leg. And I think you know, I had much criticism about doing this, um, and, and at the time, uh, I felt it was very risky. But here, you can see 
kind of the benefit of them. the the images on the left are um, her CT scan from five years post-op and you can really see the nice bone growth uh, really throughout this implant but especially at the the tibia and the the talus and calcaneus and then if you just follow her images over time initially I was obviously concerned would there be bone growth uh, into on and onto and into this implant but if you stare uh, at one year we're going to get some some bone around it two years three years and then even her five year images showing pretty robust bone growth. And so this, this really helped me uh, kind of understand that 3D printing technology can work for a lot of the things that, that we're faced with every day. And this is just a video she sent me of uh, her uh, aerobics class, or I don't know what, what this is, uh, but you can see it's her left leg that was the, the injured leg, and you can see how well she's getting around uh, on it. Um, and so, you know, again, I think, and, and I don't want to uh, Claim that that there's not a need to amputate. I think a lot of the patients we see can still benefit from an amputation, but not all of them. So many people have proposed that amputation is a great option for a lot of our patients, but I don't think it is for everyone. And if you look at some of the LEAP data, you know, cost is a, is a big issue. And if you just look at what came out of the, the LEAP studies uh, uh, on this table, if you look at that first row there, the initial cost in the first two years for limb salvage is actually better than amputation. But then what's kind of astounding is that the lifetime cost for amputation is much, much higher than limb salvage. So that's maybe an economic reason that we can focus on limb salvage. But the other data that came out of uh, the LEAP trials is that really the, the, for the disability, the long-term outcomes, reconstruct relatively equal to amputation. But more important to what, you know, part of the focus of tonight and what Jerry was talking about is our diabetics with Charcot. And the five-year mortality rate after lower extremity amputation in diabetics is 62%. And so I think to me, this really uh, uh, gives us, gives some credence behind trying to salvage uh, some of these limbs, uh, really because we could be in, in the end saving lives. And so just the, the technology that we're talking about tonight, Jerry uh, did a good job talking about the, the, the Dyna nail and the sustained compression. Um, this is the Restore 3D Tidal technology. And basically, it's a sheet-based lattice structure. And what that does is allows for 100% in interconnectivity. So there are no closed pores within, within this implant. Uh, and that also maximizes surface area for, for bone growth. Um, the pores are medium-sized, which is a nice balance between large pores uh, and, and really small pores where you couldn't pack bone. And so these sized pores will hopefully be able to hold bone graft in not let it fall out, but also during a case, allow you to actually pack them with, uh, with bone. There is some structural advantages to this design. Um, the lattice provides uh, excellent load sharing across the entire implant. And in, in this study published uh, uh, last year, it showed that there was superior strength and fatigue resistance compared to some of the other truss-based lattices of the same porosity. And so again, kind of combining this 3D printed technology with night and all compression really provides optimal environment uh, uh, for, for a biologic response, for filling defects, and then maintaining stability across um, um, the implant. And so a lot of things that we get asked uh, doing these implants, so really, really what are the indications? And this is a slide really combining the indications for the 3D printed technology as well as the Dyna nail. And I think we've talked about most of these indications, traumatic deep charcoal, uh, failed ankle arthrodesis, failed uh, replacement, loss of the talus, usually at, from, from trauma and then even necrosis of the talus. I think relative indications would be a prior and then obviously pediatric patients. And then absolute contraindications would be an active infection, really bad bone, uh, you know, plant finding these implants, we're taking away the bone, but if there's remaining bone that's not gonna grow into the implant, that would be a contraindication. They have a poor soft tissue em envelope. Um, they might, some of these patients may have better function with amputation uh, if they have a foreign body sensitivity or metal allergy, or if they have a dysvascular. 
So when we talk about <laughs> workflow, um, you know, th this, this starts uh, pretty much day one when you see a patient uh, that you think you have a reconstruction option on. Obviously, we're trying non-operative means if we can with bracing and other ways to minimize the surgery, but in certain circumstances because of deformity uh, and or a collapse, uh, uh, only options are surgery. Um, so identifying the patients foremost are really important. Um, obviously, standing extra clinic can be really helpful, but when you start talking about uh, doing something from a 3D printing standpoint, CAT scans are, are, are necessary. And what we usually do is get the CAT scan in our own facilities, uh, and there's some specifics that uh, the company can give you in regards to the, uh, uh, the type and the format of the CAT scan. Um, after that CAT scan is delivered and formatted by the uh, by Restore, uh, we have a design meeting. And basically, this is where uh, the surgeon is able to identify and explain uh, the, the thought process of what's going to go into the surgery and then design a shape, size, um, sometimes small and medium or small, medium and large, in order to make up uh, for effect. Um, after that uh, uh, design meeting is performed between you and then there's, there's a preliminary design generated and a report is sent to you, um, uh, very much like uh, a, a prescription, so to speak, um, where you're able to see exactly based off of just the type of implant that you've designed. Surgeon approves this uh, and then the uh, process of making uh, the uh, implant starts. Uh, the final design and process is then uh, performed at Restore, and it comes back to the surgeon where it's uh, sterilized. Very often, you're getting not only the implants, but uh, trials, uh, sizers, uh, in order for you to be able to pick this, this is intraoperatively that would work best uh, for you. Uh, this gen just, just goes through the printing process, uh, certainly the titanium being added, and then the uh, uh, you'll see here the layers and the 3D printing uh, going in the plate. Uh, these are uh, more of a, uh, a circular implant, a sphere up there, if you will. And you can see as uh, the dusting process uh, continues, the end implants are then revitalized and finalized uh, for uh, shipping. So going a little bit further into the specifics, uh, you can see here from standing x-rays to CAT scan to CAT images um, is the uh, imaging process that uh, the, uh, the surgeon and uh, the engineer goes through in order to come up with the best design. In the operating room, I, I'm, I use a lot of the uh, half spheres or death stars. Uh, I, I, I have a, of a circular uh, mind that allows me to um, uh, fill the defect. I often have a lateral part of the uh, sphere removed uh, to minimize uh, uh, overgrowth of impingement on the lateral soft tissue because in the majority of the cases I've been doing, I'm doing through a transfibular approach adding additional medium outer excision if need be, depending on deformity. So off the shelf, uh, acetabular ream would be really, really helpful um, and fine tuning technique, uh, uh, looking to go from size to size and then using the, uh, the appropriate uh, uh, trial components. Um, I often leave my trial components in place. I, I start my starting position for my Larry nail and um, use them in a good position for all the way up through the process. Once uh, you've prepared uh, the, uh, the actual uh, site for implantation, I use a combination of autograft from the fibula and or medial malalis, some acquiring intra-medullary uh, bone graft uh, from uh, the tibia through uh, a, a rhea type of technique, and then also using uh, bone marrow aspirate and or aleph uh, in order to pack uh, the graft into uh, the uh, shape that you have uh, designed. Very often this to me is like making a snowball. 
uh, where you're kind of working the graph down in through uh, the lattice work and then clearing both proximally and distally for uh, the nail. Uh, most of uh, the uh, design that I use for the opening for the nail is 15 millimeter hole, which can accommodate uh, quite a few different diameter sizes, depending on uh, your diameter of the implant that you're going to be using. Here on the right, implantation. Uh, this is actually six month follow up on a that charcoal reconstruction uh, where you can see bony and growth uh, and more of the bone growth anteriorly and posteriorly over uh, the actual cage uh, so you can get connection between uh, the anterior aspect of the distal tibia, the tailor neck, and then the posterior aspect of the calcaneus with the posterior part of the distal tibial plafond. I'm going to go through a series of cases just showing the utility and uh, of both implants together. Uh, this is a Charcot patient that had a fracture approximately three months ago um, that uh, was initially treated non uh, uh because of concerns of soft tissue. Um, this patient uh, ended up coming into our clinic uh, walking on this after further collapse. After a period of total contact and controlling soft tooth. This allowed me to get the CAD scan and get the CAD models and then come up with the specific sizing uh, for uh, the uh, sphere implant. And then you can go all the way to the right implantation. And this is a three month follow up uh, where we're able to restore the alignment and start getting this patient uh, weight bearing. A little bit further. Further deformity with significant uh, uh, vary, uh, where the entire medial malalis is pretty much gone. Uh, still doing a transfibular approach for this particular patient. Uh, similar technique and design uh, with the use of a, or with the lateral side uh, that is abbreviated, um, using acetabular reamers once again in order to get a good position for this implant and nail. More Charco, more Charco, diff just different uh, type of, uh, this is post treatment. This patient uh, was six and a half years out from RAF and then developed Charco collapse. You can see the GER of the soft tissue uh, there. So uh, certainly quite a bit of soft tissue and swelling, uh, almost uh, controlling this tissue and lymphatics. Uh, really important and preoperatively. So this patient underwent quite a bit of preoperative casting um, and uh, in order to get the soft tissue into a good uh, condition to allow for surgical intervention, transfibular approach with hardware removal, and then uh, subsequent nail with uh, 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 cage design. A little bit further, uh, this uh, almost a complete uh, tibio tailor uh, uh, dislocation secondary to Charcot uh, that's attacked in a very similar way uh, where we're able to reestablish th that uh, calcus underneath uh, the talus. This is a little uh, much, this is a recent case within the last three months, but just showing the utility of the, the cage with the nail in order to get uh, the uh, calcaneus back underneath and get it stably fixed so they have a good uh, platform to walk on. Here you see uh, with the nail specifically, uh, there's about another three millimeters of additional compression that can occur uh, after leaving the operating uh, room. Uh, and this is really helpful in subsequent cases. You'll see the most distal part of that nail uh, where the prominence is from the night gnaw uh, disappears. So, you know, at six months out, uh, I can see from three to six months some additional compression going on, which leads me to believe and uh, certainly agree with the studies that there, are, there is uh, some degree of resorption at the bony interface, not only bone to bone, but uh, certainly between metal and bone uh, to allow this ingrowth to occur. We'll have to try to continue to stabilize uh, through that and the night null allows you to do that. So we...
implantation. This patient with uh, increasing varus alignment and the decision was made not to revise but to uh, uh, fuse um, and avoid amputation. Secondary to uh, the bone res uh, the resection that could be done with the acetabular reamers used a similar cage design in order to defect. I think with some of the ankles that are uh, currently being on the market, uh, a sphere or a smaller cage could be utilized. You'll see later on as we get into some of the uh, agility revisions, the cage needs to become a little bit larger. Another indication was ABN. Um, this is a case where a patient that also had previous cable varus foot alignment, secondary previous tailless fracture with hardware removal. Uh, the surgeon initially tried to correct the alignment of uh, hind foot and foot osteotomies and fixation of uh, a Jones fracture, but had some further collapse uh, of that particular. So instead of keeping him using uh, the avascular nature of the bone to try to get a TTC or a tibiotocalcaneal fusion, uh, age was designed in order to fill that defect. We were able to restore some height. I don't think we got a pre-collapse uh, height, but uh, such certainly quite a bit closer to the opposite side in regards to limb length uh, inequality. I think this next one is the last case for this section where this is the, you know, only where the defects start getting larger is when the implants uh, look more bone away from the beginning. So this is uh, obviously an agility that uh, served this gentleman's purpose for quite some time, had significant increasing pain, uh, was seen in the local area and offered amputation um, versus a shortening of the uh, limb and attempts at fusion. We used uh, maybe an oblong cage or Easter egg type of cage to uh, take up not only the defect on the tailor side because of the collapse, but also to try to fulfill a distal uh, metaphyseal bone taken up by the tibial component. Uh, this gentleman is six months out uh, ambulating, uh, now uh, free of any type of bracing device, minimal to no pain, and just happy to have a limb that uh, to be uh, walked on. Um, it's all not all uh, hind foot and ankle uh, cages for the midfoot, especially midfoot charco collapse designed. This specifically uh, I wanted to bring up uh, because this particular case you can see here on the CAD image uh, there is blue and associated lack of a pink uh, additional um, guides that can be designed. These are surface anatomy guides. Uh, so uh, you can uh, be similar to uh, the, the um, patient-specific instrumentation for total ankles, which are uh, um, uh, anatomy guides. We can use these surface anatomy guides on the midfoot in order to identify the level of resection and also the angle of resection. This is all done in the uh, pre um, printing phase and design phase. So uh, able to use these with pin fixation and then run your uh, saw pins in order to get a precise angular cut. Um, and then the increasing three different sizes for the cage where you can use beaming techniques up the first metatarsal and I chose to use the third metatarsal and then certainly tying in the uh, hind foot. Uh, this patient is six months out. Weight bearing is uh, tolerated with custom molded diabetic shoes and inserts with a plantar grade uh, foot. I feel that I've been able to, with cages, uh, uh, eliminate some of that hardware failure that we see with just uh, beaming alone because of the lack of healing between bad bone to bad bone. Thanks, Jerry. Those are some uh, great examples of how to use this technology. One thing I forgot to mention earlier is that we will have a question and answer session at the end of about 10 to 15 minutes. So go ahead and text your questions uh, uh, to us. Um, so I'll show a few of my cases, uh, various uh, follow-ups and indications. Um, so this is a 76-year-old diabetic male, prior MVC, um, 
and he has obviously you can see here that he's failed fixation uh his pylon has collapsed um and really even this was a trauma he is a, a uncontrolled diabetic and, and likely that led to arco ankle and collapse as you can see here and so what jerry uh talked about uh, you know just some steps in this case uh, number one obviously would be to remove the hardware in that second image on the top left uh, you can see a bunch of pins as he talked about and i'm cutting along a cutting guide that's uh, been made uh patient specific to his bone and then um, the next set of images going, uh, placing the, the trial and reaming. And as Jerry talked about, I, I ream uh, up to the last step with the, with the trial in place and then go on the bottom. Then I'll put the, the actual implant in, reinsert my guide wire, and I make one pass with the reamer just to set the implant uh, in the location it needs to be for that nail to pass. And then the next step would be to, to insert the nail itself. And, here he is at one half year follow up, and similar to that first case I showed, um, he's starting to get bone growth. Uh, you can see it along the posterior aspect of the even along the inner side, and then both medially and laterally. Um, and he he is he is pain free. Here's a tra trauma case. This is a 22 year old female. Uh, she was also involved in MVC. Uh, she had open tibia fractures with uh, quite a bit of bone loss, as you can see here. Um, she actually fell into the category of seen at, at one of the hospitals that doesn't have any traumatologists, only has uh, locums ten surgeons, and they kept kind of passing her on to the next surgeon. And so she was left in there for three months uh, and eventually came to see me. She, as well as uh, in addition to that prior, the prior patients, she had a sensate foot, a uh, neurovascularly intact foot, um, but she was offered amputation. Um, so I decided to uh, do the, the exact same thing. Here you can see in the um, are some of the the bone loss uh, there's a guide in the middle image and then the trial with the nail being placed and she's uh, a little bit over a year now and you can, if you look at that ap image you can see the amount of bone that's growing and, and hopefully into that that cage and even if you don't what i would say about her this is a snapshot from her from her big chart from the therapist and you know if you look at the bottom she has uh zero pain um uh she's not been able to go to the gym, uh, but she's worked on stretching her foot, the swelling in her ankle by the end of the day working. So she's working uh, on this and, and, and pain for it. So I think that's a win for, for her. Um, here's some other cases, some a little bit longer term follow-up and different indicates, uh, even some of my, my prior cage use. And so this is a 21 year old with neurofibromatosis who had 13 prior surgeries. And I think the, the key here is that we all know about the pseudoarthrosis or the non-union that, that they get in the tibia. And you can, uh, uh, and, and again, to try to re revise this thir well, 12 prior times uh, and get it expected to heal, for me to do it again would, would, would be insanity. And so um, I thought maybe we can take away his entire pseudoarthrosis, sorry, pseudoarthrosis span that with a cage and and provide him some better quality of life you can actually see his his fixed deformity um in the ER. and so if you look at what we did um you can just see how in these ap and lateral views how with one surgery one uh you know one step uh, how we corrected his deformity in two planes and here he is at one year um working and just again to tout waiting on some of this bone growth um, you can see here that at both ends, initially post-op, we don't see good bony ingrowth, but then by one year, we see see good ingrowth. So I think if you're going to use these cages and early on, you don't see such great bone growth, uh, keep an eye on it. But usually at about a year, I'm starting to see some pretty good. But I don't want to just talk about our successes. There are certainly, I've certainly had a lot of failures with, with, with this technology. Um, just because it's not a panacea, um, I think one thing you can't argue with is that we really solve large bony defects, but we have to remember that these are still just large metal implants. And the things that we've been taught in our, our training are that all metal fails eventually. If, if you know, it's kind of a race, if we don't get good bony in growth, these implants could fail. Um, and we also haven't necessarily um, um, been able to a win every time with actually getting bone to grow into these implants. And so that's something we have to solve. And certainly I don't recommend um, using these in infection because again, it's a big metal implant that is prone to bone and, and increased infection. So I'll just show a couple of my failures to, to 
show that they, they do occur. They, they uh, uh, occur for, again, the same reasons that our other metal implants have failed in the past. And so this is a 59-year-old male who had prior fixation for a sarcomary tooth deformity. He's, he has coronary artery disease. He has had multiple surgeries to get to the, the, the state that he's in, in these images. He had, did have a history of infection. I did take him back for bone biopsy, which was negative. And then I decided to remove all this bad bone and place a cage and, and a nail. Um, his post-op period, he never became free. Uh, I felt there was a lack of bone, bone growth on his x-rays and CT scans. So I actually took him back and added stabilization. And after that procedure, uh, about six weeks after he came in the clinic with erythema, fevers, and he had elevated infection labs. And so that happened when I put additional screws. Was this a, a, a indolent infection that, that reared its ugly head after receiving this big metal implant? Uh, you know, I'll never know. But um, I took him back and, and took the implants. And here you can see bone uh, into this implant, uh, both on the ends and uh, on the on the sides, but again, it wasn't enough uh, uh, to make him uh, uh, without pain, and so took him back, took the implant out, and he has a cement spacer. And interestingly, he, you know, and again, this becomes somewhat of an ethical issue, but he he wants to save his he wants me to save his leg and 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 try this again. Had multiple conversations with him now, and, and I'm not sure that that's the best answer. And limb an amputation may in this case be better than than limb salvage, but it's an ongoing process. Um, Here's another case of an aseptic union uh, that um, resulted in amputation. And then and this is something to be concerned about in our diabetics. Um, the images on the right are where like, he was doing well with regard to his implant, but he ended up having a UTI and he actually seeded his, the cultures from the amputee uh, where grew out the same thing that was in his UTI. So I believe he sees his implant from his urinary tract infection. Um, and while we've showed some kind of home runs here and some failures, truly there's still a lack of data. Uh, this was, was my series on my first team um, with greater than one year follow-up. Um, 13 remain intact without evidence of non-union. I had two failures, so that was about an 87% survival. Um, the two failures were for the exact same things I just talked about. One was for infection and was, one was for non-union. Of the ones that didn't go on to failure, they did have significant improvement of, of some uh, uh, patient reported outcome scores and certainly pain. So in summary, uh, uh, so 3D implants and uh, sustained compression are very good at treating large uh, defects. We certainly know that this is a challenging problem with, as we mentioned before, very limited treatment options. Um, the goal here is, is to avoid amputation in the patient. Um, um, especially in our diabetics with the high mortality rate. And uh, again, the 3D printed uh, title technology uh, and sustained compression, we feel uh, provides a really valuable solution to these problems. Um, I'd like to again, thank MedShape and Restored. Uh, here are the contacts for, for both companies. And then I'd also highlight, I hope you, hopefully you're all are staying safe out there with the COVID crisis, but uh, just to show some of the 3D printing that's Re Restored is doing, uh, working with Duke uh, engineering response team to kind of retrofit retrofit our our um, arthroplasty helmets to use as as masks as well as um, uh, uh, um, splitters for ventilators. Uh, they have donated donated printers and and time to this effort. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us and uh, we'll come up with a system now to answer uh, the. Um, I think I'll have the questions and I'll ask, uh, I'll answer some and ask Jerry to answer a few of them as well. All right. Um, so one of the, one of the questions is around, um, these are it's just obviously a challenging, you know, operative technique. Um, and the question is about stabilizing the joints prior. And I will say though, you know, one, one thing about the 3D M printed implants and what Jerry mentioned about um, kind of the preoperative scenario this is really a lot of high level preoperative planning and it really makes the the is a lot e easier but the specific question is about how do we stabilize the joints and the problem is though with these tall cages it's very hard and I, I do benefit from having assistance uh, of assistance in the operating room 
but the, the part of the preoperative planning is kind of getting the right height or the right size of these implants. And then the trial is that same size. And so a lot of times I'll have an interference fit with that trial in place. And that really helps stabilize, say, my calcus uh, to my tibia with that, with that um, uh, interference fit of the trial. And then it's, it's pretty easy to have an assistant hold the leg while I uh, pass the guide wire and then the, the eventual reamers. Jerry, do you have any other, because uh, um, it is different than when we used to use like a femoral head where we could pin across the femoral head and then do our nails. So these, it's, a, it's an animal. Jerry, do you have any uh, pearls for yeah. this technique? No, I would I probably echo the same about the implants really being able to do that stability, whether you're doing it in the ankle hind foot region and or across the midfoot. Um, once you're able to create an area that matches the cage, seeing those trial implants and they, they so for each size you get a trial implant for that particular size. Um, so with the place they have a nice handle that's on them, you can have somebody hold that um, uh, in, in place while you start your fixation, that's really helpful. I think if you're really limited and uh, then perhaps uh, placing on a temporary external fixator or uh, uh, perhaps um, even some sort of distraction device um, uh, would be okay, Put placing a pin plan into the proximal tibia and then one into the, the, into the calcaneus and using that as a, uh, a stabilization why then you can work, uh, especially if you're the only surgeon with one tech in the operating room, uh, use what uh, you've learned in the past, external fixation, just to be as a temporary fixation and then pull those pins at, at when you're finished. Yeah, I think those are great points. And one thing you, you brought up briefly, didn't mention because we kind of showed our final results is that when these, when we're in the design process, a lot of times we are requesting two, three different size plants. So we get those different size implants and those different size cells. And that is a lot easier to get the, the fit in the operating room. Um, one of the other questions we got is about packing the cages with, with graft. And um, I have to say that I completely pack these cages, but I don't, especially taller structures that are getting 10, 10 centimeters in height. Um, that would be very expensive. I do, if I am going to remove the fibula and the medial malleolus, I do as Jerry described and, and I morselize it, get out the bone mill, but I will also additionally use various stem cell grafts and occasionally BMP. I would love to say I was able to have a graft to everything, but again, that would be cost prohibitive. So I do pack the ends uh, and a lot of times I'll pack that the hole through the center of the cage where the nail is going to go as well. How about you, Jerry? Do you always pack graft? Uh, I'm packing graft pretty much all the time. Um, and it is a combination of auto graft. Um, I do like uh, uh, being able to take it from the intramedullary canal with some sort of uh, reamer irrigator aspirator type of device. Sometimes you can get up to, you know, 20 to 30 cc's from the proximal tibia. Uh, of course, if there's no total knee in place, um, that always becomes a, a little bit of a do so take that into consideration and make sure you're uh, you're looking for those proximal incisions on the on the around the knee, um, and then you uh, the combination of the mill and the um, and morselizing it. Usually you're able to get enough to cover the cage and then pack it medially, laterally, anteriorly. Um, and if you have a bone graft in those areas that you can get uh, the flow of the bone over the cage. Excellent. So this is a great question and I've, I've uh, had this problem in the OR. Um, occasionally I've been doing one of these and I may have forgot to post a tabular reamers and so I'm using uh, whatever is on the shelf. And so Jerry, you showed a nice set of acetabular reamers. I've found that sometimes a cage design will actually be smaller than the smallest reamer set. Are you, what are you using here? Are you using specialized reamer sets? Um, are you smarter than me and always posting the correct things? Or what, what, how do, what's the smallest reamers you have? Yeah, I, I think the smallest reamers we have in-house are 36s. Um, one of the things that I've recently have done um, is uh, uh, they're able to make a action-specific guide um, where you're able to fit that over the lateral process or whatever's left of your talus. And then doing is advancing uh, a guide wire that I would usually use my MTP reamers. Um, and then start with the reamer 
customer to create a, uh, a dome, so to speak, or a defect, and then I sequentially go up from there. So I might start with an 18, move up to a 20, 22, uh, humor uh, on the uh, MTP side and then switch over once I have that crater created switch over to the smallest size uh, um, uh, acetabular reamer because at first when you have no real cup to put the acetabular reamer in it's very hard to control so if you're able to create some degree of a crater with smaller reamer, EP reamers that are readily available, that gives you a centering spot to then use your acetabular reamers on. Yeah, I think that's a great great point because these reamers will on your will will walk on you, and if you don't have a there to kind of set them in place, be a problem. I'm also using a lot of fluoro when I initially start reaming to make sure I'm in the correct spot. One of the questions was, are these just the standard acetabular reamers with the stiff handle? And that that is what what I use. Um, this is a great question. Uh, what were we doing before these 3D implants? And we showed some of the the problems with the the other um, um, I don't know technology or methods out there for salvage. And I will say, for the most part, I was using femoral heads. But when it got to be the point that uh, these defects were, were too big uh, for an uh, femoral head, then, then amputation was a reasonable option. Jerry, what were you doing a lot of before the 3D implant? Yeah, most mostly femoral head out reconstructions. Uh, certainly did a few transport uh, in the appropriate patient. I, I think it's really important to try to match that procedure to the patient. Uh, nothing's worse than getting halfway through your bone transport and the patient uh, end up saying that they can't take it much longer and want the, uh, the fixer off. And then on uh, amputation, certainly. And uh, like you've discussed in the past, amputation is not necessarily always a bad option. Sometimes, especially if there's going to be incursion uh, with that particular patient, then amputation might be a good option in some of these. But uh, in the di diabetic patient population, if we can save the limb, um, and I usually, you know, there's this phenomenon called the Obi-Wan Kenobi phenomenon where they come in and it's like they've seen multiple patient, uh, multiple physicians with the idea of amputation. And it's like, you're my only hope. Um, I usually give them, uh, you know, one try at salvage. And, uh, and if then, unfortunately, we've already talked about amputation well before we brought up the salvage idea, just knowing that it's a real possibility. Uh, so I always get a little bit worried when I hear the OB-1 phenomenon start out in clinic visits, but it's, uh, it's rewarding, no doubt, if you're able to a limb, but certainly uh, taking into consideration the patient's function afterwards and what they're going to be best uh, left with. Um, that's great. Um, so there's a couple questions regarding uh, weight bearing after uh, placing plants. Um, it, it, I've gone back and forth initially. Uh, for instance, that first patient I showed you, I kept her non weight bearing for, for three months. Um, I've gone to some type bearing at a couple weeks once the incisions are healed. Now I'm kind of back at a four to six week starting weight bearing, even though I haven't uh, bone growth, obviously, at that point, um, but I'm looking really for some of that, that compression. What are you doing, Jerry, for your, for your stop yeah, non, protocol? Uh, usually for the first six weeks, absolutely not weight bearing the best of the patient's ability. Um, maybe, obviously, we know these patient population put weight on it, but really try to keep them to set down weight only for that first six to eight weeks. Um, and then I try to uh, put a little bit of weight on loading, but really don't, uh, especially in the Charcot patient, neurop neuropathy patients, don't let them go full weight bearing uh, with uh, uh, blessings speak until about three months. At that point in time, they're protected initially in total contact casting, and then uh, perhaps a diabetic. And then I use a lot of times uh, a MAFO uh, brace line with plastizote as I get them out of a orthotic like a boot and or base and, and then get them into something that they can start wearing regular shoes with. Obviously in patients that are non nor uh, then I'm letting them weight bear much earlier and because uh, their bone quality around that area is significantly 
better. And we're doing it usually for either a uh, you know, ankle implant failure or trauma that has a significant bony uh, defect. So really tailor your weight bearing status afterward the patient population that you're working with. Excellent. Um, so we had a question about, is there any role for this for subtalar, basically subtalar distraction or arthrodesis? I didn't obviously show heat case, case of that, of a calcaneus fracture with subfibular impingement. And I did a, uh, and then obviously some various collapse and I did a, a wedge uh, with a screw and it actually worked really well. Have you done any of these for subtalar distraction arthroplasty? Yeah, I have a, a few out there and it, it seems to be a little bit easier than what we were doing for and trying to cut specific graphs for it. Uh, when you're able to design specifically for the patient, uh, really helps. Um, certainly, uh, if there's a way to make it more the shelf in the future, that probably uh, uh, the next steps, but yeah, a few cases uh, that's really helped in that regards too. Excellent. Um, so one of the questions about where do we see this technology going in the future? I think certainly the first step would be some coatings on these imp, maybe antibacterial or something to increase uh, bone growth, um, and then eventually in the future it will be future will be bioprinting. Um, but Jerry, do you have any any? insight onto the future of these implants? No, uh, the two ideas certainly that I've thought about is just uh, how we can introduce uh, antibiotic situation, especially in patients that have previous history of infection and or uh, those patient populations that have severe deformity and wounds that you're worried about. Um, and then, uh, you know, for defects and soft tissue, a way to, uh, you know, utilize uh, 3D uh, to uh, act in between a you know Achilles tendon that uh, has signi significant degenerative changes that you know you want to try to still use the driving force of the gastroc and sole uh, and attach it to heal. Is there ways to bioprinting for for that in the future? Um, those are all things I think uh, excited to see what comes down the line. Um, so this is kind of a combined question. Um, uh, and it relates to one of the failures that, I, that I've showed. So the question is, how accurate is the CT or how accurate have you found the CT? Uh, um, and then the pre-planning to what you actually see when you're in the operating room. And kind of a piggyback question to that is, if you are in the operating room, you, you feel that more bone needs to be taken, how would you manage that? And I think I learned that lesson with one failure I, show, I showed that was an ethic non-union. I, I realized I had taken enough bone, necessarily realized that in the operating room, but I think post-operatively there's still sclerotic there, and that was the reason for failure. And so I've become a little bit more liberal in the preoperative planning as far as uh, taking a little bit more bet bone back to where I feel is a healthy margin. Um, so I have not been faced with the, the scenario of getting in there and feeling I had more bone, and then now my, my implant is, is too small, but I think that is certainly a risk. And that case, I'd probably do a cement spacer or external fixator and then, and then come back at a later day. But the other part of that question is I have found that from the implant designs and measurements have been very accurate, especially with the cutting guides that we've used to take away some of the bone. And so, Jerry, what are your, what are your feelings on that? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I would agree with you. The pre, preoperative decision making is really helpful. Uh, looking through your CAT scan yourself and then coming up with a design. And uh, what I've noticed is that um, I tend to smaller than what I'm designing. So, you know, in discussions, I, you know, when we measure things out uh, with uh, the CAT images, uh, usually I, I pick whatever we um, end up saying is the size. Um, and actually use it as the largest and make two, sm two smaller sizes. Um, I really think we overestimate how much bone that we have to remove. Um, so I'm usually going smaller on my sizes to make sure, and I always have three available. Uh, that way I can go back and forth between them. And I usually I'm placing each of the trials in to see what the, is the best fit. If I do run into a situation where I'm just not prepared, which Thank goodness I, w I haven't yet. I would think you know, doing some sort of uh, uh, cement spacer and uh, uh, reevaluating and coming back at a later date would be what would be the best option. Yep. 
Um, right, so we have one question about how long does this process take? And, and um, you know, I, I've had, I think it does vary a little bit on the complexity of the design. And honestly, some of the delays in my designs have really been on my part, finding a time to meet with the engineers and then finally approve design. But I think probably the fastest turnaround time would be two and a half to three weeks. Uh, how, how, how have yours been, Jerry? Yeah, I mean, uh, they've been getting quicker and quicker. I think a little bit on both sides. And on uh, uh, certainly my des the design that I use, there's a question, do I always use this somewhat spherical cage with the lateral part cut off? Uh, yes, at this point in time, I find that to be the for me um, in being able to fit and uh, uh, the defects, I'm able to make the defect the size shape of that uh, more reproducibly with the acetabular, acetabular reamers. So that's why I'm going with it. So as I got more comfortable, uh, there's a learning curve, obviously thing. Uh, the time, a turnaround time has decreased and I would say and most of the time it's on me getting back to the line team and saying, yeah, this is where we're at. So it's around a two week, two to three week turnaround right now, which in, in my opinion is great because that allows me to one, get the uh, CAT scan off to them, but the patients are kind of, lack of a better word, sitting. Usually, a lot of these patients need total contact casting to perhaps control their soft tissue swelling, get their the limb into a, a better shape uh, for uh, surgery. Uh, so it's gone from six plus weeks down to two weeks. Uh, they're doing a great job in getting these cages back uh, almost uh, uh, real time. Uh -huh. Um, we have a couple questions about kind of the, the midfoot Charcot, especially the, the case that you showed, and one's a uh, weight-bearing CT scan. I think um, for me, I don't always get a weight-bearing CT scan for, for these cases, but for the midfoot Charcot or really any of the, the foot uh, implants you're thinking about using, I think the weight-bearing CT really, um, um, at least me, uh, when I'm talking with the engineers, figure out where the anatomy should be and, and getting really that tripod uh, restored. So I do favor weight bearing seat for, for my foot um, implants. And then one other regarding that, that is uh, for these um, kind of Charco midfoot wedges, do we do internal and external fixation at the same time? Um, I definitely do the internal fixation. Um, I've been hesitant to external fixation in case I would get a pin tract infection that would communicate with the or eventually communicate with the cage. So I've been hesitant to do that. I don't necessarily think it's wrong, but I've been hesitant in the potential infection. Uh, Jerry, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, if you have the ability to CAT scans that are weight-bearing, that's great, or even the ability to uh, simulate weight-bearing in a CAT scan, there's ways that you can do that too, especially with um, uh, the midfoot charco. I think that's really helpful. You'd be really surprised if you haven't had the experience to sit down with the engineers it's amazing how they can use the CAD images and basically take the part you're going to want to remove from a bad bone standpoint. I know I keep on saying bad bone, but it's just a vague term to kind of describe. And then they're able to restore that tail of first metatarsal axis to what you think is going to be best. Um, so um, with that uh, engineering that they work, the CAD images, the, the design for that particular wedge, not only from medial to lateral, but from plantar to, to, to dual, really is helpful. Um, I, I'm not adding external fixation to these because of similar concerns. I think if I have a patient population that uh, was, uh, that you know, I knew was gonna walk on it sooner, which they all tend to do anyway, um, to a little, to some degree. But if I had that I was really wor worried about, then I'd try to get external fixation outside of where my, my uh, actual internal fixation is. It may allow these patients to walk sooner, but those super constructs uh, on top of, uh, you know, the cage and the nail get quite expensive. Um, and certainly that's one of the, you know, the, you know, the concerns here is certainly how much does all this cost? And I can tell you, you know, uh, my hospital is probably one of the toughest uh, and, uh, and we all say that, but they really are in regards to uh, pricing. And uh, I've been really happy with a lot of the uh, companies that we work and working out uh, something with the institutions to allow us to take care of these uh, patients. Uh, because very often we're tertiary, 
referral centers, uh, they, they need care. Um, I, I often leave it to the uh, industry and also our uh, purchasing and uh, you know, value analysis committees come to a, a agreement and uh, it, it's been working out very well. Um, we have another question about staging procedures. Um, I don't know if hopefully it's coming really concerned about infection. So any questionable history, um, I will stage the procedures. I'll go back to the, op or I'll go to the operating room, take out some of the hardware, take cultures. Um, um, but at the same time, while that's happening, I'm also in the background handling the implant so that if the negative were ready to go with the second stage. How, how about you, Jerry? Are you staging these? Yeah. If I have burns, I certainly have, you know, a full preoperative workup uh, as being especially any uh, past history of infection and or uh, any symptoms of infection, I'll certainly stage it, get cultured and come back. Um, if the bone that's infected, I will remove obviously in cement, biotic cement spacer, and come back at a later date after the patient's uh, fin biotics and uh, try to uh, minimize uh, recontamination. So, yeah, I, I think those situations, just like any other situation, an open wound, try to get it healed. Try to rule out infection prior to doing something big where you're putting this much metal into that area. Um, so, with all these cases certainly being done, don't forget the, the basics uh, when we're we're when we're doing this. Along that. Line, there's a question about following the hemoglobin A1C. Um, you know, I think uh, for me, I, I do try to get them, if, if we can, down into the kind of six, seven, eight inch uh, um, before doing your. Do you have a cutoff? Do you, do you follow the A1C afterward uh, to, to maybe give the best chance at, at bone growth? Yeah, I mean, in perfect situations, I, I get it below eight and then pull the trigger um, and then post-operatively. Um, there are some patients that, you know, may take a year to get below eight because of where they are at. And if their limb is at risk um, and we're, we're at a point where, you know, uh, we don't have any other options and lean out and, you know, we have a long uh, about the increased risks that literature can be cited in the show um, increase risk and then ultimately pull the trigger. But uh, most patients uh, really want to work with you. You get your, their endocrinologist and their family docs involved. Um, the other thing is looking at their D levels, calcium levels, uh, certainly plus or minus uh, thyroid. Um, all those come into play um, and uh, certainly the smoking. Uh, and, uh, do any active smokers at the same time. I get them off the cigarettes, uh, make sure their nicotine is clear at the best of my abilities, and then uh, they stay off at post-op. Uh, so all those things come in today preoperatively. Um, I'll combine a few questions that we've had. Um, you know, I guess one of the things are, are um, you know, what are the patient benefits of using these 3D implants? And um, have they shown to be any better with limb salve or other things we talked about? And I think the second part is that really, no, there's not data so far that compares these implants to any of the other methods. I'm certainly a believer that long, uh, they will benefit limb, limb salvage, but I cannot show you any data at this point. Um, um, but Jerry, what do you think the benefits of, of, of to the patient this 3D, 3D implants are? Yeah, so I, I mean, and it's it's all based off of what I feel as compared. There's not enough literature and enough done yet, but I think through the combination of multiple surgeons working in certain areas with similar patient populations, we'll probably get to higher numbers in the future. But I think the benefits are, you know, we see what has happened in the past and in, in history in regards to uh, Charco especially, uh, but some others in regards to uh, the other grafting materials that we use, hardware failure. And early on, I'm not seeing that where failure that I did before. Um, I'm not relying on bad heel to bad. We're, we're getting uh, some stability from plants because of their structure. 
Um, and then I do think we're getting that gradual ingrowth over time. So the actual cage is providing additional stability. So the implants alone have to do it by themselves. Um, and I think adding that to this as compared to bone that can collapse or resorb or, you know, incorporated as well is the benefit here. Uh, speaking to that, there's a question about uh, when do you see the element for the dyna nail completely um, kind of retract back into it, to its resting state? And, and for me, it's been in about four to six weeks on average, I'd say. Uh, how about you, Jerry? Yeah. Yeah, I would say about the same. Uh, there are some that um, within the first six weeks, it looks like it's gone from six to none. And then I question my intraoperative technique about getting as much compression as I could. Um, I've seen a few cases uh, with the cages specifically um, uh, where at six months, I still have three to four millimeters to go. So um, you know, making me think that perhaps uh, we didn't get as much resorption and or, you know, intraoperative uh, compression, which you can uh, uh, achieve uh, also has been, you know, maintained. Uh, so, but I would, I would agree with you around that three month mark between six and uh, uh, weeks and 12 weeks is where it typically disappears. Um, a couple questions going back to the the sizes uh, of the implants. And so um, there's about, you know, obviously we're gonna use one size and there'll be others left over to be used on other patients. And the answer is they're custom uh, printed for that specific patient uh, and they cannot be used uh, for any other patient. And then um, another um, along that line is a question, if you do have multiple sizes printed, is that in cost of the case? And the answer is um, it's, it's a fixed cost. Um, and then uh, there was a, a somebody that uh, didn't hear us state or before about the graft and w asking what what is used in these and and it's varied. I use autograph the the medial malleolus. I'll use stem cell grafts. I'll occasionally use B. Jerry mentioned about using rhea from the patient's uh, tibia or, or fibula for the graft. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so uh, one there's one question about um, a 3D printed implant failure and having to revise it. I will say I have revised uh, a non-union or implant that also went on to a non-union and then subsequently a, a below the knee amputation. So it, it it can happen and and be one of those scenarios that we've talked about or the contraindication maybe I was missing something about this patient ever being able to to. Um, stimulate a, a bony healing response to, to the implant. Sorry, I'm just looking at the... Uh, the oh, uh, uh, um, so actually, there's a question about antimicrobial prophylaxis. So one thing I've been doing, um, obviously, they're getting intraoperative antibiotics. Don't give them any preoperative antibiotics. And these are, again, are, I'm not concerned about an infection. But intraoperatively, what we do is I'll, I'll um, take the implants. And I, again, even at the beginning of the case, when I'm not totally sure which size I'm going to use, I'll put all the sizes into a basin with several grams of vancomycin and then and then add uh, saline and basically let them sit in antibiotic uh, wash while I'm out which size I use and then I pull it out of that wash and, and, and pack it with graft when I new size I'm using. Gary, what do you do for antibiotics? Uh, so <laughs> in fact, I mean, they're getting preoperative antibiotics um, uh, only. Uh, haven't, you know, besides oral irrigation and uh, during the entire procedure, I haven't added additional antibiotics post-operatively and or for long term. Um, I have one patient that had uh, a subsequent wound um, that I then, you know, treated non-operatively for wound care and uh, placed her on long-term antibiotics uh, and eventually healed. But the majority of it is uh, pre-op and getting it right before the patient goes to sleep. Um. So um, one, there's a question about bone stimulators, uh, and um, there's you know obviously mixed literature on on the use of bone stimulators. Um, 
I typically don't order one at the six month mark or something like that. And I don't know if I've really rarely ordered one for, for these cages. I think sometimes the benefit is though that um, if it's a failed prior region, they may already have a bone stim. If they do, we'll ask them to start use that after after the cage placement. How about how about you, Jerry? Uh, I haven't used them specifically at this point for that. Certainly, I agree. The literature you know, is mixed. Um, I think it's unreasonable to use uh, it at all. I just haven't had the need. Uh um, we got another question about cost, and again, it is hospital uh, um, specific. And I will say, my hospital has been great about working with me on on cost consciousness, and I had a uh, a problem with 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 uh, implanting these uh, devices. I think that's it for the questions. I'd like to thank everybody for uh, uh, tuning in tonight. Like, thank you, Jerry, for this Med Shape and Restore Three D. Uh, for sponsoring this and everyone stay safe out there. Thank you. Thank you all.